before doing any review, there's one thing that I wanted to talk to you about regarding the last topic that we covered. The last topic that we covered, of course, was derivatives. We haven't had time to talk about anything other than one type of derivative, which is forward contracts. But there is something that I wanted to tell you because someone asked a useful question, which is what is the difference between forwards and a different kind of contract called futures? And I thought it was worth answering that question because um, um, I, w I want to avoid confusion. So a forward contract is an agreement between two parties to buy, sell, of course, if one is buying, the other one is selling, some asset, whatever it is, at, first of all, a future date and at a price that they agree on beforehand. Okay? That is a Ford. So let's um, let's give it a name. Let's say the P Ford is the price that you've pre-agreed. Now, Ford contracts um, sound great, right? If you're planning to sell an asset, it sounds great that you're able to lock in a price. If you're planning to buy an asset in the future, it's great that you're able to lock in the price in advance. Um, the question, the, but there are still two undesirable things about Ford contracts. Um, one is that, remember, suppose I have $1 million um, dollars worth of bonds right now, and um, I will, I'm planning to sell them at the end of the year, um, I, and I wanted to enter a Ford contract, I would need to find someone who wanted to buy exactly that kind of bond, wanted to buy exactly at the same time that I wanted to sell them, and wanted to um, buy the exact amount. In other words, it might be really, really hard to find someone to, who's willing to, to buy my Ford contract. So one way of putting that, that something is really difficult to sell, is to say that Ford contracts are very illiquid. So there's a liquidity problem with Ford contracts because it might be really hard to find anyone who's actually willing to agree to you to, to this on the other side. The second is the following. Suppose you've agreed on some price P Ford, right? The year goes by, and it turns out that the actual price, let's call it P, turns out to be higher than P Ford. Well, I've agreed to sell these bonds at this price, but it turns out that I would much rather sell it at a different price, right? Because the market price turned out to be higher. In other words, I have an incentive to break my contract. What if instead it turned out that um, the price when the year has ended is less than what we've pre-agreed? Well, now the other person had agreed to buy the assets from me in a year, but for them it would be much cheaper if they just bought them on the open market. So they instead they have an incentive to break the contract. In addition, of course, um, things could be even worse. What if they agreed to buy these bonds from me 
And regardless of what the price turned out to be later on, they went out of business before. So then they're not there to fulfill their side of the contract. So all of these risks between these two parties, um, of them not wanting to go through with the contract or not being able to go through with the contract, so that is known as counterparty risk. So these two people involved in the contract are called counterparties, um, and there's this counterparty risk. So it would be really nice if there was some way of having something like a Ford contract, but that doesn't suffer from as much illiquidity and doesn't suffer from counterparty risk. And that is precisely where futures come along. So a futures contract is almost exactly the same as a Ford contract, except that instead you have a, so instead of um, there being, um, okay, let me back up. One thing about futures contracts is that they are of a fixed size. How does that help you? Well, suppose that futures contracts are denominated in 100,000. So let's say um, if I agree, if I buy one futures contract, then that means that I'm agreeing to buy um, bonds with face value of 100,000 next year. What if I actually wanted to buy a million. Well, all I need to do is buy 10 of them, and it's going to add up to a million. If I wanted to buy 10 million, I buy 100 of them. It just adds up. So that kind of takes care of the liquidity to some extent, because what it means is that I don't have to find one person with whom to match. Right? There could be um, five contracts with one person and three with another person and as long as it on my side it adds up to what I want and on their side it adds up to what they want it should be fine. Second, um, neither you nor I actually have to do any of the matching because instead what we all do is that we go to a financial intermediary where Instead of finding someone to buy or sell the futures to or from, if you want to buy, you just go and buy the futures from this intermediary. If you want to sell, you just go and sell the futures to this intermediary. The intermediary has a special name called a clearing house. And then, of course, <clears throat> um, they don't necessarily zero out, right? The amount that people want to buy isn't necessarily exactly canceled by the amount that people, or doesn't necessarily equal the amount that people want to sell. But when the time comes, the clearinghouse just can buy or sell however many it needs to make sure everything balances out. So that takes care of the illiquidity. What about the counterparty risk? Well, um, <clears throat> there, anyone who wants to buy a futures or sell a futures contract has to also open a special account with the clearinghouse where they have to put some money. And this is called a margin account. All right. Um, now, remember before we said that if um, the price ends up looking like it's going to be below the pre agreed price, then the person who um, sold the contract, right? okay, the person who's promised to. Um, Okay, the person who's promised to buy bonds, 
would be unhappy finishing the contract, right? Because they could buy it more cheaply on the market. They'd like to break the contract. Well, if this event happens, then the person who's promised to buy the bonds in the future has to increase the amount of money in their account. In other words, their possible losses from having agreed to this contract have to be paid up front by putting them into the account. So they can't break the contract later on because they've already had to put money in up front to, um, <clears throat> to, to um, re make sure that loss actually is realized. And similarly, the other way around, right? If the price looks like it's gonna be above the Ford price, then the person who promised to sell the bonds um, is unhappy because they would rather sell them at the higher price. But then what the clearinghouse does is says, well, it looks like the price is going to be above the price you agreed. You have to add some money into your accounts now in order to realize the loss. And so the clearinghouse already has um, the funds and um, doesn't have to worry about you defaulting and refusing to pay because you already had to pay up front. So in a sense, forwards and futures are the same, but in reality, they are, um, the, the difference is that they deal with liquidity problems and counterparty risk by having this clearinghouse who's in between all the buyers and sellers. So you don't need to know who is on the other side, the clearing, you just deal with the clearinghouse. Same as when you open a bank account or take out a loan, um, that's someone else's money, but the bank is coordinating all the flows of funds. And then again, there's this margin account to deal with counterparty risk. And this is true of many derivatives. There's often a clearinghouse and a margin account that you have to open to realize losses up front to try and deal with counterparty risk. Okay? So it's a long story, but it does, but there is a difference between futures and forwards. It has to do with this arrangement. Whereas a forward is, again, an argument between two parties. Whereas here, there is a clearinghouse in between. Okay? Of course, that means that futures markets, so a forward market could exist for anything, as long as you can find someone who's willing to make the agreement with you. Whereas futures markets only exist for things that are widely traded, like um, US government bonds, like um, foreign currencies, at least some foreign, widely used foreign currencies. Um, for other things, it might be, it might not be worth the cost of setting up the clearinghouse. Shares, futures. Any questions about about all of this, about forwards and futures? If not, then my next idea was to start going over what we've done in the semester to draw out the main themes and see if there's anything that you're unsure about. Um, before that, Sophia wrote, can people try to break a futures contract? Well, if they did, they would lose the money in the margin account. So the margin account also kind of serves as a deposit to stop you from breaking the futures contract. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, we referred to the cri financial crisis of 2008. <clears throat> one of the things that happened then was that the clearinghouse collapsed for um, certain kinds of assets. And if a clearinghouse collapses, you can imagine that that asset market is now in chaos. It's not even clear who's gonna buy and sell, you know, who, who, who's on the other side. So that's a special case where of course the clearinghouse itself went bust. But in general, um, you don't have an incentive to break, to break a futures contract because again, you would lose the money that you put here in the in the margin account. Okay. Anything else? If not, 
Then let's go to the second part, which is <clears throat> what did we do this semester so far? So the first thing, and you'll need to, this, this second, I'm checking the chat. This material on the exam, um, Fords will be on the exam. Not necessarily this discussion of futures, but um, I just want to make sure that when you have a question about what Ford contracts, you don't start discussing futures because they're not the same. They're not exactly the same. I wanted to make sure that you were not confused about them being the same or not. Now you know the difference. So one thing that's going to be there for sure are the basic definitions, which is what we started the semester with. And these were things like just we had to learn some vocabulary to even be able to describe what we were talking about in financial markets. For example, direct versus indirect financial markets. Um, we started off using that in the context of um, you and I lending money to each other as opposed to having a bank in between us. We actually just saw another example, right? Um, Fords are direct, uh, an example of direct financial markets, and futures are indirect. Then other basic definitions were debt versus equity, things like that, primary versus secondary markets, and so on. So first, make sure that you know what all of those things are. <clears throat> then we moved on to some more abstract or theoretical definitions, which were the two types of asymmetric information. As I said, that's a bit more abstract. And the two types are, of course, moral hazard and adverse selection. And for these, you need to do the following, of course. First of all, you need to be able to define moral hazard and adverse selection. Second, when presented with a situation, you should be able to um, determine whether it's a situation where you should be worried about moral hazard or adverse selection. So you shouldn't be, shouldn't, should be able not to, should be able to avoid mixing them up. And third, it might be good to have up your sleeve an example of each of them from financial markets. <clears throat> um, if I don't remember where it's in the past midterm, but some years, I mean, I remember one year I just asked a simple essay question might be define moral hazard and give an example from financial markets or define adverse selection and give me an example from financial markets. So make sure that you are familiar with those definitions. An example of adverse selection in financial markets would be um, the mortgage-backed securities that we discussed from 2008, where there were collections of mortgages um, that um, were packaged together, basically, and sold on. And people thought that the packages of mortgages were safe. And then suddenly they realized that, <clears throat> that they were not. Essentially, there was, they were exposed to the risk of lots of people defaulting at once. And so suddenly it mattered. Suddenly people realized that there were good and bad mortgage-backed securities. And so that's the key. There has to be different quality of assets available first. And second, that potential buyers know much less than potential sellers about what's actually in there. Because then if someone is selling you the assets, you can reasonably assume that it must be of bad quality because if it were good quality, they'd be holding on to it. Uh, moral, hazard, mm, moral hazard example from financial markets. Um, So let's say if I, well, there are plenty in the book, but one possibility is that, um, yeah, too big to fail is fine. Let's say a firm is really large and it's, um, 
feels that it's insured against failure because the government will never let it fail. So that gives them an incentive to do very risky things because if anything goes wrong, they'll get bailed out anyway. That's, that's a fine example. Um, there, we'll, we'll look at more examples soon actually. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I I'm, I'm probably wanna keep that one on my sleeve. Um, moral hazard is taking out a loan for one reason but using it for something else. That is true, that works fine too. Mm, let's say if I, um, right, let's say I'm bor I, I tell the bank that I'm borrowing because I'm going to start a flower shop, but in reality I take the money and I go to Las Vegas and spend it gambling. Um, you might wonder why, um, why um, so a normal person who actually has a business plan that's good probably wouldn't do that. But what if my, what if I borrow money and then I realize that my business for which I borrowed is almost surely going to fail anyway? Well, then I might have an incentive to do that, right? Because if I go to take my money to Las Vegas and <clears throat> gamble it and lose, what's going to happen? I was going to go out of business anyway. I wasn't. I couldn't pay you back regardless. If I win, everything's great, right? I pay you back and I make some earnings and everything works out. So the risk of moral hazard is particularly high when someone is in real trouble anyway. That's when they're likely to do something that might otherwise seem rec reckless. Um, keep that in mind soon when we talk about options. It's going to come back. The idea that when you're really, really already in trouble, you might moral hazard <laughs> suggests that you might as well take even more risks because you're kind of screwed anyway. All right, let's see. Um, after that, and discussing how moral hazard and adverse selection account for some things we see in financial markets, we then went on and talked about, whoops, what happened here? I see. We then went on and talked about the simplest asset, which of course is money. So remember, there were some new definitions associated with that, like the concept of liquidity. So you should review what liquidity is and remember what it basically means is that um, while the definition of money as a, as a means of exchange seems like a very narrow and precise definition, in reality, because there's some things that are so easily converted into money, we need this sort of spectrum of liquidity to try and um, categorize different assets and depending on where your cutoff is for um, what is or isn't liquid, you can end up with different definitions of money like M1, which is strictly what we use as um, currency, um, well, sorry, what we use as money, currency or, dep or checking deposits, or M2 if you widen your net to include savings accounts and short CDs, and M3 and so on. And we can also talk about, we can talk about the liquidity of any asset, as you may remember from later on. Also remember that, of course, nowadays, all the money that we use um, is fiat money, <clears throat> as opposed to the kind of money that um, was used uh, some time back, which is commodity money. The difference being fiat money has value only because it's money. It only has value because it's used in trade. It doesn't have any intrinsic value. So, for example, paper money isn't valued based on the value of the paper that makes it up. Whereas commodity money is made of an actual object, and its value is, let's say, in the case of a gold coin, its value is the weight of the gold coin. If it's... <clears throat> pepper or salt or other thing, or silver for that matter, again, it would be just connected to how much of that material is there and what's its value. So that distinction is important too. <clears throat>
Then we moved on to the next simplest form of financial contracts. We spent most of our time talking about this, which is debt. We talked about direct loans, we talked about bonds, and we talked about how to try and compare different kinds of um, payment structures because you could have a very simple asset where there's just one future payment or you could have something like a mortgage where there are many, many payments over a long period of time. And we found that the tool that we can use to try and value all of these different things is the, excuse me, present value formula. So you should remember that and be able to use it in any given context. <clears throat> of course, what this does is it connects. So this is whatever future payment um, the asset entitles you to. M is the maturity and how many years is it going to be. I is the implied interest rate. And then P would be the price of that asset. Because the price of that asset is what, when you sell the asset, it's what you get up front. An F is what you have to pay later on. So in that way, a bond of this kind is a form of debt. If instead you have many payments, what you need to do is apply this formula separately to each payment. And then M is the date at which that payment is made or the number of years until that payment is made. And then the present value, then the price of that asset would be the sum of all of the present values of all those payments. So that's important to remember how that when there are many payments, you have to value each of them using this formula separately. Then you can add them up and you have the present value of all of them together. <clears throat> we discussed, so that was the first part, which was just sort of getting a connection between asset prices and interest rates using this formula. But we still hadn't discussed, so what are the sort of fundamental economic determinants of interest rates? And for that, we looked at the fact that there are various ways in which two assets might, um, might be different. One, and they were in terms of things like risk, liquidity and we also discussed taxes as something that could vary across assets right some assets the earnings from some assets are taxed the earnings on municipal bonds are not so risk illiquidity and taxes are all bads right they're all things that you wouldn't like in an asset that you are buying you would rather it were safe, not risky. You would rather it were liquid because then it's easy to sell and you would rather it were not taxed. So all of these things are bads. And as a result, intuitively, if an asset has risk, then you're going to need to be compensated extra for that risk. Same with the liquidity and taxes. So anytime an asset has any sort of negative properties, Intuitively, it's going to have to have a higher interest rate because no one would buy it unless they were compensated for them. An alternative way of thinking about this is that um, suppose an asset is risky, then its desirability isn't as high, so I'm not going to want to pay as much for it. And of course, that's the, since the, this F is fixed, the only way this can be true is if this interest rate had risen. So asset prices dropping is the same thing as interest rates rising. Okay? Good. Then we also, the next thing we did was we discussed that <clears throat> there are also some systematic macro factors that affect interest rates. And one of them we discussed was the state of the business cycle. So interest rates tend to rise when the economy is growing fast and decline when the economy is growing slowly. We also discussed that another macro factor that affects interest rates is expected infl inflation. 
If inflation is expected to be high, that's also a bad for the lenders, right? For asset buyers. Because high inflation means that the dollars that I'm going to get paid back aren't worth as much. <clears throat> so again, using the same intuition, I would need to be compensated for high inflation, high expected inflation rather, um, if I'm going to be persuaded to lend to anyone. And that dovetailed nicely with the next topic, which is where we've spent quite a lot of time lately, which is the fact that bonds could also differ in terms of maturity. So you should remember that if you take uh, if there's an asset that exists in, in different maturities, and that asset is usually government bonds, you could draw a graph plotting the interest rates on bonds of different maturity against the maturity, and what you would get is called a yield curve. So you need to remember <clears throat> some facts about them, one of them being that they usually slope up, although not always. And they usually slope up when interest rates are unusually low. They're uh, more likely to sl slope down when short-term rates are unusually high. And we need to know a theory of how, why it is, what it is that determines the shape of the yield curve. So you should remember, again, that there are two factors behind the shape of the yield curve. One accounts for the fact that the yield curve usually slopes up, and that is that, you should remember this discussion, long-term bonds tend to suffer much more from interest rate risk. The risk that to the extent that you may wish to sell a bond before it's expired, before maturity, you're exposed to the risk of fluctuations in the prices of those bonds, which is the same as fluctuations in interest rates. And longer term bonds suffer from this more because a change in interest rates affects, um, <clears throat> well, I guess just because for a larger M, this I is one plus I to the power of M is a larger number. So if I changes, it makes the whole thing change more. That's one way of thinking about it. Um, in order to talk about interest rate risk, remember we also had to introduce the notions of the uh, rates of return. And we also had the capital gains rates because interest rate risk is the risk of experiencing a capital loss when bond prices decline, when the prices of bonds that you're holding decline. Um, of course, bond prices might rise as well, but again, we generally um, are risk averse because well, we just are, we don't like uncertainty. And so anything that's riskier, again, is going to carry a higher interest rate, on average. That was only one factor, however, because the other factor between um, affecting interest rates, um, let's say, um, over some long time frame, let's say um, five years, is what do you expect to happen to interest rates to short-term interest rates over those five years. Because of course, if someone is borrowing for five years, their alternative is to borrow for one year five times in a row. Or if someone is lending for five years, their alternative is to lend five times in a row for one year. And so as a result, another factor is that expected future rates also affect the shape of the yield curve, and that's why it's not always true that the yield curve um, is upward sloping. That's why the yield curve can change over time. Um, yes, Marshall, is the rate of return equal to the capital gains rate when the coupon rate is zero? Yes, 
In general, they're not, right? So sure. Um, Marshall asked, is it true that the rate of return versus is the same as the capital gains rate if the coupon is zero? The answer is yes. But more broadly, um, I was just about to get to this actually. It is important to make sure that in general, these two things are not the same, right? The capital gain is only the change in price of an asset that you're holding. Okay, capital gain is an increase. Um, um, if it decreases, you can call it a capital loss or a negative capital gain. The rate of return, on the other hand, has two parts. One is the capital gain. But if your asset gave you any other payments in addition, such as, as Marshall is suggesting, a coupon payment, then the rate of return has to include that as well. So don't forget that they're not the same. <clears throat> I could give you an asset that has a payment, let's say a coupon, and ask you what's the um, rate of return. You would have, have to give me one number. If I ask you what's the capital gains rate, you'd have to give me a different number. Again, unless there is no other payment. If there is no other payment, then the only thing that you get is precisely the change in the price of the bond. And so then they would be the same. Same for shares. You can equally talk about rates of returns and capital gains rates for shares. In that case, the payment is a dividend, not a coupon. So that brings us, so there are two more things. Um, that we did. One was that given that the shape of yield curves is affected, among other things, by expected interest rates, it means that um, the shape of the yield curve tell us what people expect about things like the business cycle and expected inflation for the future, since, of course, those are determinants of short-term interest rates. So if a yield curve is unusually steep, it means that people must think that in addition to the usual interest rate risk, they expect interest rates to be going up, which means they expect the business cycle to expand or it means they expect inflation to rise. In the other hand, if a yield curve is flat or even downward sloping, what it means is that Although there is interest rate risk, there is another factor that's making the yield curve flat or slope down, which means that they must expect short-term rates to decline. And short-term rates decline when the business cycle um, is contracting or when expected inflation declines. So that way we can extract information about the, what people expect to happen in the future from the shape of the yield curve, and that's why, one reason why we spent so much time on it. We are talking about nominal rates, absolutely right. All of these are nominal rates. The real rate, of course, you're absolutely right, is something you need to remember. The real rate is the nominal rate um, adjusted for inflation. That's exactly right. And you need to remember the distinction. Speaking of business cycles, can you comment a bit on supply effect and demand effect? Um, in a sec. In a second. So I'll get back to that. So let me just uh, finish the list of things that we need to have in mind, um, and then I'll go back to your question. The last thing that we discussed were that we started talking about equity. And our discussion had two parts. One was how do we think about the pricing of shares? And so you need to remember that, the generalized valuation, dividend valuation model. Um, just as the bonds, we think of um, the price of the bonds as being determined by the present value of the bond payments, whether it's one or many. Uh, 
In the case of shares, the payments are dividends. And let's see, I referred to them as DE, let's say today is date T. So the first dividend payment is next year, DT plus one, DT plus two, DT plus three, and so on. And we discussed that just with the bonds, the price of a share should be the present value of these expected dividends. The E there is expected. So we have to discount them just as before. But instead of writing I, we wrote, at least the textbook writes K of E. This one would be squared. And so on. This is the second I. There we go. So we take the present value of each of them and add them up, where KE is the discount rate on at things that are as risky as equity, right? It's not going to be the, let's say, this is not going to be the one year government bond rate because shares are riskier. It will be something that adjusts for risk appropriately. But remember this discussion that we had that even though shares, different shares might carry different risk, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, all the shares should have different discount rates. And that's why we had this whole long discussion of the principle of diversification. Remember that there is idiosyncratic risk, there is systemic risk. Idiosyncratic risk affects are events that affect different companies differently. So let's say um, we discussed that whole rain versus sun experiment. Some companies are helped by rain, some companies are hurt by rain. But if you own the shares of both of them, you don't care about rain, right? And similarly. <clears throat> Um, of course, there may be some events that affect all companies badly, and we refer to, we refer to that as systemic risk. And you can get rid of all idiosyncratic risk if you diversify your holdings of shares or assets more generally appropriately, leaving you only with systemic risk. So that's why this discount rate on equity is not something that varies across um, different shares. The assumption is that you are a sophisticated investor and you are um, already holding a diversified portfolio, so the only risk add, um, that this particular share exposes you to is already systemic risk. And the same is true of any of the other ones. Okay? So that's what we did. Um, now, I think it was Marshall had a question, um, which was about why is it that um, why is it that interest rates um, go up in expansions and go down in contractions? And I can answer that quickly here. Um, one way to approach it is by just drawing a quick diagram of demand and supply. So this is the quantity of bonds. Let's say there's some demand here, some supply here. And the question is, first of all, we have to always make sure that we're clear about who is on the demand and who is on the supply. So <clears throat> the Let's see, a person who is buying an asset, so the demanders are giving away money now in exchange for money in the future, right? So the demand side must be the lenders. And the supply side is the borrowers. They're getting money up front when they sold the asset. And of course, they have to commit themselves to repaying lenders, so they're the borrowers. Great. What happens when the business cycle expands to 
borrowers. Well, when the when the business cycle expands, it means that this is a time for um, where the un business opportunities are unusually good. So this is a good time to borrow. Right. Then the question is, what is going to happen to demand? For demand, well, um, since the GDP is growing faster, remember GDP is also income as well as production. So that means that the population generally has more money. And to the extent that they decide to save that money, that means greater demand for bonds and other assets because that's how you save. And so this should move as well, the demand. Now, whether bond prices actually rise or fall relative to where they started is going to depend on which one of these effects is the stronger one. Um, but if you think intuitively, it's probably the supply that's going to be stronger because, again, <clears throat> when the economy is growing, people have more money. That means that they want to save more, but people only save a small percentage of their income. So this demand effect is probably weaker. And so what you get is that in a business cycle expansion, prices drop. And remembering, of course, our old friend, the present value formula, that's the same thing as saying that interest rates rise. Okay, so that's the full explanation um, about why the business cycle effect is um, <clears throat> is the way it is. Any other questions about this or indeed anything else? Feel free to put in the chat or just unmute yourself or raise your hand. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. I guess um, in that case, let's see. Maybe it's, maybe it's worth doing one more thing here then, which is doing the same thing for why is it that inflation affects interest rates. So, all right. So next, this is to do with in expected inflation, also known as the Fisher effect. So, the key thing here is to think about, again, what is the impact of expected inflation on borrowers and lenders if it rises? If inflation turns out to be high, what it means is the, the future payments aren't really worth very much. So that means that the lenders get paid money, get paid back money that isn't worth as much. So they would be unhappy. On the other hand, the borrowers get to pay back money that isn't worth very much. So that's a good thing from their perspective. So <clears throat> the borrowers are on the supply, so they're happy. They would like to borrow more. On the other hand, the lenders are not happy. They don't want to lend as much, meaning they don't demand as many bonds. And so here, unambiguously, you can see that the price of bonds is dropping, which again is the same thing as saying that the interest rates must be rising. And so that's the intuition behind the Fisher effect. <clears throat> okay. Great. Let me save this. And if there are no more questions, yes, there is one more question. So nominal and real interest rates move in the opposite of the same direction. So here is somewhere where you have to be careful. So suppose I, so if, if, okay, so it depends in, a, in the sense that if you and I, suppose I had already lent you money, so we've already agreed on a nominal interest rate, 
right? So now it's stuck. Um, <clears throat> any inflation that happens between our agreement and the end is just in your favor and against me, right? So that's not the Fisher effect. That's just when inflation happens that you didn't already take into account, the lender is hurt and the borrower is happy. What the Fisher effect is saying is that, therefore, when you're negotiating in the first place on a lending contract, <clears throat> it would you must take into account how much inflation there is going to be so you're compensated for it. So um, what it means, I guess, is that, um, let's write down the definition again. The real rate is the nominal minus inflation. If you know that inflation is going to be a certain, so the idea is that what you really care about is the real rate. Right. But we don't, when you and I are agreeing on a contract, we still haven't agreed yet. <clears throat> we don't know what the real rate's going to be. Although we know it's going to work out this way. If I expect inflation to be really high, I'm not going to agree to lend money to you unless the nominal rate compensates me for this additional inflation. You see what I mean? So the difference is about what happens ex post. Once we've agreed, well, we are exposed to the inflation risk. But before we agree, if I know that inflation is high, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to lend to you unless you've adequately compensated me for that inflation with a higher rate. So then the expected real rate might, um, so the idea might be like, I'm not going to lend to you unless you've compensated me for the fact that I had to wait for a year before um, being able to buy stuff with my money because I'm giving it to you. And so then how much that is, how much you need to pay me in real terms in order to persuade me to lend to you is just something that has to do with how I feel about waiting. And that's just part of my preferences, right? Um, therefore, ultimately, the expected or desired real rate is just something to do with, <clears throat> with, um, with people's preferences or how, how willing they are to give up goods now in exchange for goods tomorrow. And then, of course, any nominal rate that you agree on has to be able to be enough to persuade you to lend and compensate for any inflation. All right? So that's a good question there. And let's see. Okay. Very good. Anything else? Let me save this. If not, then I think we have enough time for our usual exit quiz where you get to check that you've learned um, what we discussed today. And also, if you're the winner, you get to put a silly Snapchat filter on me. This is a quick midterm review. So, first question, which of the following is an example of fiat money? Gold coins, silver coins, salt, or the Chinese renminbi that's currently in use? All right, most people got that right, very good. Um, <clears throat> TJ is in the lead. Next, a one-year bond has face value 220 and price 200. What is the interest rate on this bond? 
Let's see. Very good. Most of you got that right. Question three, the 2006 yield curve is mainly flat. What did people expect to happen to future interest rates in 2006? Rise, fall, be constant, or be very uncertain? <laughs> Someone's thinking hard about this. Five seconds left. All right, they're expected to fall because it's flat. So that means that something is offsetting the interest rate risk. Lisa is in the lead, great. <clears throat> you buy a share for 100, a year later you get a dividend of 10. <clears throat> and you sell the share for 130. What is your rate of return? Remember, read carefully. <clears throat> the dividend of 10, and you sell it for 130. You bought it for 100. What is your rate of return? Two, one, okay. Maybe someone, <clears throat> we need to review our rate of return definition. Marshall is up to the top. Almost done, a bond you want to buy pays present value 50 or 100. The seller knows, but you don't. How much should you pay? No more than 15? No less than 15? No less than 100? Or no more than 75. <clears throat> Very good. This is a classic case of adverse selection. You should not pay more than the, the bad version. <clears throat> Richard leaps into the lead. Last question, the real interest rate is what? For this, you need to rearrange the words into the correct order. And then hit the K exclamation button when you're done. So drag each word into the correct position. <clears throat> and Thanks to, I think it was Sophia's question, you actually just got to see this. All right. <clears throat> Let's see who won. <clears throat> Third place is Alexandra C. Good job. Second place is Marsh, and first place we have Lisa. <clears throat> Good job, everyone, especially Lisa. So, what do you want me to do for the class ending? Um, is there any filter with flowers? Flowers? Flowers. I'm sure there are many. Um, let's see. Um, those aren't very spectacular so far. Let's try a particular flower. How about daisies? <clears throat> mm, no, it's just putting daisies on me. There must be something more spectacular here. Let's try a rose. Nothing. Hmm. Flowers doesn't seem to to work very well, but um, <clears throat> I guess this is still something. How about flower face? That's All right. Good. Well, I guess that's, that's good. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, study hard. Do your best, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks, Professor. Um, best of luck. Professor. Thank you.